Today's media and fans are changing. Their appetites, their interests, everything. That brings us to today's guest, Jack Settleman, CEO and creator of Snapback Sports. Snapback is the largest sports Snapchat account in the world, totaling over 500 million views to date. What's going on, Snapback fam? Baby goat checking in here. And Jack and his team leverage other social channels, collaborations. You know, we're the old Why? ones in the room. <laughs> Memes, experiences, betting, fantasy. It's amazing. No. That's why I just try to keep giving Jack questions like, what would you do if you were leading ESPN? Sometimes I get on loop. How would you change things? What does a new audience want? What is the younger generation looking for? This sports card just sold for $5.2 million. Snapback Sports, their tagline is a new way to consume sports, and they do just that really well. So let's learn a little something about fandom with Jack Settlement, CEO of Snapback Sports. Hey, Jack, what's happening today? Not much. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this conversation. I think you tap into a very unique audience that I'm always intrigued by. As somebody that's been in the content and sports media for a long time, I love the changing audience. So I'm glad that we can get into this conversation. Start out with this. Um, when I was doing my research into you as I kind of prep for this conversation, you so often see everything about you with that first kind of adjective of, He's 24 years old. He's 24 years old. He's 24 year old guy did this, that, and whatever. And my first thought was it almost dismisses you a little bit. It makes it sound like you're a lucky guy who hit the lottery and just happened upon this scenario. But you put in the work. I mean, you got your, you graduated from UT Austin in sports management. You interned at Sports Lock, Hashtag Sports, Whistle Sports, Nike. You worked at the Action Network. I don't want anybody to dismiss you as somebody who just got lucky in this process. How important was it for you to build that foundation of sports and business knowledge so you could be successful in this entrepreneurial venture that you're going into? Yeah, great question. I turn 25 next week, so I feel like oh, I, good. I feel like the young the young boy in the industry is is quickly moving away, especially with all the TikTokers who are super successful at 18 years old now. But yeah. it's a it's a good question, and I think it was hyper important. And so one of the people that I looked at while I was at college was Gary V. And he talked mm-hmm. a lot about you know the freedom and working for yourself and all these different opportunities out there. But then as I kind of went along and and figured out what I wanted to do, I took a lot of advice from other people who said, you don't have to be, you know, an entrepreneur on day one. You can use the resources. You can use the learnings. You can use so much experience from a bunch of people who have been in the industry for a long time. And I think that's what I did over the past five years, whether it was in college with those internships um, or in my first couple of years working in the sports industry. It wasn't until January, so six months ago, that I went full time in this. So like you said, okay. you know, I, I love the, the overnight success. I think anyone who's successful in their own field knows like people always view it as that, um, except you've been working on this thing for over four years now. So that experience being a number two being a number three and learning from a bunch of more experienced people was one thing i wanted to do before i went out and eventually um was running my own thing i think it's super impressive i just want to make sure people understand that you put in the work it's not just some you know catch a catch a star you know overnight success kind of thing you've put in the work and i think that's important to give everybody a little bit of grounding in this conversation um it's funny i was thinking of this uh as I was kind of going through some stuff, I got into an argument on Twitter like four years ago with Mark Cuban because Mark Cuban was saying a sports management degree is a complete waste. There's only 90 professional sports teams. They only have about 300 employees each. And then, you know, you multiply that out and there's more sports management majors than there are actual jobs out there. And I was like, that's completely wrong. There's so many jobs in sports that have nothing to do with actually working for a team. There's so many more opportunities out there. And you've really exemplified that. You kind of carved out your own niche. When did you kind of figure out that this was a kind of path you wanted to head down? When did it strike you as like, I think I can do something here? That's an amazing question. And I love talking about this because when I was studying sports management at UT, a lot of our projects were with the minor league baseball team here and the minor league uh, basketball team in San Antonio. And I thought the only option was you got to go through that wretched move to the middle of the country and sell double A baseball tickets. And, yes. you know, and, and no disrespect. Wretched to might people. be strong, but yeah. we'll, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm with you to those people. And, and there certainly is a path. And if you want to work for a team or you want to get into the front office, that is absolutely a path. 
But for me, I kind of looked at it as that's not what I want to do. I don't love sales. I don't love selling to people in Missouri that I don't know. So what are other ways around this? And it was really just build this Rolodex of skills. And so I knew, you know, social media always, I feel like every year social media is like, it's growing and it's evolving. But even back then it was somewhat young. I mean, there wasn't even Instagram stories at that point. Like imagine a yeah. world with no Instagram I know, stories. crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I figured out very quickly that there were like these 16 year olds who were running the world on these kick messengers and group me groups. Yeah. And so I was like, I'll dive into that and I'll learn and I'll figure out like these other ways to build skills within the business. And that was my first job at Action Network was in social media there. And really, ever since I've been tied to social media. So getting ahead of the trends and learning those skills, I think the, the sports industry is so ripe with different opportunities. Like you mentioned, it's not just the sales path into working for a team. There's marketing. Yep. There's there's a I mean, NFTs, right? Six months ago, that, I was, know. that was not a thing. Now, if you go study an NFT, you can get hired by every single team because they don't know. You'd be the thought leader yeah. in that subject. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy because I started in the industry and I, don't, I hate dating myself, but I started in the industry in 1996. Like I was working at a br traditional broadcast network and we did highlights and we did news stories and like you could see it becoming irrelevant when I was doing it. Like we started to get to a point where it was like, we're not, we're not incorporating social media enough. We're not doing these new things. And you could start to see it almost dying on the vine. And I started to think, and I started to panic and was like, I got to pivot. I got to do something different now. And I think that's really interesting about Snapback is that you have really captured where the audience is now. What is it in your view, as you kind of analyze where you're at right now and, and where you've gotten to, what is it that has made Snapback so relevant to, and to the needs of today's sports fan? Why, why do you think you're hitting the mark? Yes, that, that comes from two things. One, studying yourself. What do you do on a daily basis? How do you consume the content, right? Like, are you on YouTube or are you watching Sports Center in the morning? Growing up as a kid, I would run that hour Saturday morning Sports Center, get all my highlights, and then I run it Hell back, yeah. right? And then yeah. I run it back. Hell yeah. But, yep. but I haven't watched a sports center on Saturday morning to get highlights in five years. So what are you Everybody. doing as a person? And then second is, is unequivocally listening to the audience. And we call them the snapback family because, you know, social media was supposed to connect us. I wanted to be able to get LeBron to answer me because I could never do that unless I walked up to him. Now, right. all it really did was give a big platform to a lot of people who already had big platforms, right? It's just a new, bigger platform, but it yep. did bring up some new opportunities for people. And so I wanted to have people understand, like, I'm not a superstar. I'm not Stephen A. Smith. I'm not any, like I'm just a casual sports fan who kind of figured out social media, loves sports and will debate back with you. And because I have a big following, people think it's, you know, a little more special, but also listening like, hey, why didn't you post that Cubs highlight? Well, OK, I'll go find it. Like, I'll go commentate kind of on what I thought about that. So yeah. always be listening to the audience. They'll keep you a step ahead of what's about to come. I think that's great because that that connection, you use the word community and and I think that's really important to have that kind of honest dialogue, that honest conversation with each other and to, to really listen and act on what they're saying. They're giving you the hints. They're telling you what they want. Right. So listen to it, react to it, use it. Um, I, I was really interested in looking at the way you categorize Snapback as you have you know, you have memes, you have highlights, you have experiences. And I think that's great that you really know where you fit and what you do. And I was thinking about it like, man, when you're first starting out on something like this, I love as a content guy, I love the behind the scenes. I love the unexpected views of what's happening at a game, kind of that holistic approach to an event, which you guys are really encapsulating. When you're first starting out, though, I mean, money's tight. It's hard to get some of these things. Was there ever a point where it felt like, I mean, before you had a million followers, before you had this brand behind it, was there ever a point where it was like, man, I can't wait till the revenue catches up with my ideas? Because it's not cheap to go around to games and try to be in the moment. Was that ever a difficult part? Good question. It was a unique situation. And I luckily started while I was a senior at UT. So we had season tickets to the football and the basketball teams for very cheap. 
And then I would kind of just leverage my connections or friendships. You know, we were only three hours from Houston. So I had a bunch of Houston friends who had Astros tickets or Texans yeah. tickets. Spurs were close. So I had that. Um, and then a f my family business is actually beer distribution and we sell to the Ravens. So once again, like kind of just, you know, squeaking your way into those spots. So that kind of carried have. it. Yeah. Yeah. Those that carried it for a little. And then the year while I was at Action Network, I was working live sports hours. So I actually didn't get out to a ton of events. And that's kind of where, you know, you didn't see a lot of experiences. And then I went and worked at Whistle Sports and they kind of helped me. And they said, OK, we want you on the grounds here covering that unique content. And I think one of the things, you know, you've been in sports for 25 years now and I grew up going to sporting events. I didn't realize this till I listened to the community. I would bet over 50 percent of my audience has never been to a sporting event. Right. Yeah. So that's crazy to me because I literally grew up going to games and I love yep. going to games. But I didn't realize even at the time that when I'm showcasing a stadium or behind the scenes or the, the food at the stadium or meeting up with fans who are going for the first time, like they've actually never seen that stuff before. And that's the really cool content. They can see the highlights from the game, you know, on TV or on Twitter. But that's really the content that is is hitting close to home for them. I think that's amazing. And I, and I do love that stuff. I was at a, a pitch meeting one time with a sports network and I started to sell them so hard on like just do all behind the scenes stuff like everybody can share highlights. Everybody can share that's like public view public knowledge your distinct advantage is that behind the scenes stuff because i think that's what people like is to see the human side of the athletes for sure yeah. um, there's a lot of pressure in social media to constantly be creating how hard is that because if you if for me it's like you come up with a great idea and you push it out there and it has a success moment and you're immediately on to the next thing there's always this need for more there's more appetite there's more demand uh, does this come naturally to you? Are you naturally coming up with these ideas and banging them out? Or is there ever stress points where you're like, this is hard to keep up with? That's a good question. There's levels to it, I would say, right? There's the type of content that you can kind of create on a day-to-day -day basis that is kind of just like, it's not taking deep thought. It's just taking simple work, you know, getting it out to the page. Or if you go on the podcast, like we're not, our pod isn't doing deep research. It's really just reflectionary on game three of the NBA finals, right? So we plan it out, but it's not anything that's crazy to think about. But then there's like our new snap show, which is evergreen content that we really have to structure and produce it and think really hard about. So it's like getting to those mental activations. So you have some content that probably best off for the afternoon when it's not as intensive but in the morning when you're most creative like build that stuff and do it but I think there's a skill to it but I also think there's a lot of hard work there's a lot of research that goes into it uh, but yeah you have to be constantly constantly creating constantly recording it can, it can definitely become overwhelming what's your approach I had a guest recently who said you need to be failing like you got to try things, you got to stick your neck out there. And if you fail, that's a good way to grow and to learn, which I totally embody and agree with. And I'm, I'm guessing you probably do too. How much do you guys just explore with trial and error? Let's try something. Let's see what happens when we do it. Or is there more planning that goes into it than most people might realize? Ton of, ton of failures, ton of trial and error, like you mentioned. I'd say less with the content and more so with the platforms that we want to play on and figuring out, okay, does the audience have a need for this, which is a chat about the podcast? Does the audience have a need for this, which is TikTok content? I think not only is it overwhelming to think about creating content day by day, but to think about pushing it to every platform. And that's where, you know, going back, that's probably the best decision we made. We just worked on Snap for a year straight, did not push to my personal page, did not per yeah. push to Twitter, did not push to TikTok, did not push to YouTube, none of it. For a year, it was strictly Snapchat because we knew that it would be, it, that would have the big, or we didn't know, but you know, it turned out that would have the biggest payoff. And then you can kind of go from there. So a lot of new content creators, they come in with no followers across any platform and they're like trying to get a cut for Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. They look similar when really they should probably look a little different, be formatted different, use captions, use different music on platform. You know, so that's where it becomes overwhelming, less so the content creation. And so my recommendation is always like pick a platform that makes sense for what you want to accomplish. I wanted to showcase live sports and 
talk with the community. And I thought that vertical story like feature made a lot of sense on Snap. Little did we know that every platform would then go and copy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to dig into that a little bit more too later on just your choices behind Snap and how you feel about its future as well. But I, I want to circle back for a second. Um, I feel like for me, if I look back over my career, I feel like it took me 10 years maybe to find my voice, to really know how I wanted to communicate, to find my comfort zone, um, just really be confident enough in my, my point of view and my way in approaching things. And some of that may have been deprogramming my you know, college experience or my early journalism career because there's a structure in place that you just get really foundationally built into you. How did you get to this place because I'm very curious about this, this confidence spot where you're able to say, I'm going to do things a little bit differently, feel pretty good that it's going to work. Like, that's impressive. That's impressive to really lean in as hard as you have and go at it with full confidence. I think you just have to be yourself. And one of the biggest things that's instilled in the page, you see a Sports Center account, a Bleacher Report account. They're big media companies and they're posting the news and the highlights. Our account, every single person following knows I'm a Ravens fan. They know I went to Texas. They know I'm a Knicks fan. We'll talk about why all those reasons maybe later. But <laughs> but they know. And it's I a think, diverse group yeah, of, of it fandom is. Well, right I went there, to UT. Yeah. I grew up in Maryland. And then I moved to New York. Didn't have a basketball team. Got season tickets. Like, that's kind of the explanation there. But they yeah. know that those are my teams. And that's so natural to be in a sports fan. Everyone is, in sports is from a biased lens. And then ESPN and SportsCenter and Bleacher, they try not to be. And I don't actually know if that's what fans want. Like, they want biases. That's why they watch the first takes. That's why they, you know, all these yeah. things. Pat McAfee is blowing up. And, like, his love for the Colts and all those indie teams, like, people, they ride on that. So I think being yourself and just being completely organic has really taken it uh, for a nice ride. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, there's so many things I could throw out there as far as my, you know, early training of like no cheering in the press box. You know, don't don't ever show your loyalties. Just really have exactly. a take yourself out of any story. And it's like that whole world is turned upside down, which I kind of love. I, I actually I really love. It's no kind of about it. But I want to I want to go again deeper. We use this word authentic all the time. It's so hammered down now. We talk about authentic branding. We talk about chasing authenticity. Um, authenticity this, authenticity that. I get it. It's right. But what does that mean to you as far as being authentic? Because you just hear people say it to the point that it gets diluted a lot. When you approach your content and your strategy and your planning or whatever you're doing in the moment, how do you like level and ground yourself in this concept of authenticity? What does that mean to you? Well, it's a great question, especially given the last year where politics were very confrontational. Um, a lot of stuff. Has, I mean, there's always a lot of stuff going on, but it felt like the last year was super important. And I kind of took the stance of my beliefs. So, you know, I wanted to support the African-American community through BLM. I wanted to support not necessarily trying to speak on politics, but my belief through the whole thing was I just want like people to be nice again and to be friendly again. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of put my personal beliefs into the page a little. Now, I'm not saying on a sports page you'd need to be voting for this person, but I think, you know, it is framed in a, in a certain way. And we lost followers because of that, without yeah. a doubt. And I was OK with that. And I think I'm from a fortunate position like I had followers. So it's easier said than when you're trying to grow. But I understood like if those people, they don't have to agree with me, but if they're cursing at me and telling mm -hmm. me I'm an idiot and doing stuff that I just don't think is beneficial to the page, to the account, to the business, then I, I'm okay with them walking away. So I think that's being authentic. And then the second level to it, which has always been since day one is, is the authentic brand partnerships because we see probably a thousand ads a day that we don't even recognize. Yeah. But the human is getting so good at diagnosing them. TikTok, if you go on TikTok, they're starting to stick ads in between all those videos. Your swipe through rate on those is probably 10 times higher than the true for you content they're offering to you, which is insane because you get a tenth of a second and your mind is picking up on that. 
So any partnership that we try and pull off, I have to be a user of the product. I have to actually believe in the product. We try and take equity in a lot of the opportunities that we can because I think that shows like, hey, we're not using you as an ad platform. We're using you because this is actually, we're offering you something good yeah. and here's the one we've chosen to go with. So that's always been something we've done since day one. And then giveaways too is being authentic. Like I mentioned, if half the audience has never been to a game, then I want to send people to a game. I want to get them out to the stadium. So when, when brands come to us and they're willing to send people, I mean, we're sending someone to game four of the NBA finals tonight, which is nice, you know, super cool. And yeah. so I think when they see that that's genuine giving back to the community, that's another level of authenticity. Totally agree. I think that's really cool. Um, let's play this out for a little bit. I think I don't watch ESPN nearly as much as I used to. I used to watch it constantly. We both referenced that earlier. Fox Sports, I worked at Fox Sports. I don't watch it nearly as much anymore. Um, it just don't. I, I don't read it as many long-form articles as I used yeah. to. I used to read Sports Illustrated from cover to cover. I don't do that anymore. I've changed as a fan as well. If you were somebody from ESPN calls you up and says – what do we need to do different? What do we, how do we, how do we engage with this fan base still on broadcast TV? That's who we are. Like, yeah, they could, they can do other social media things, but like, how do we make our TV product more interesting? What kind of advice would you give? What, what would you share? So I'll, I'll be honest in admitting that, you know, given like what ESPN's audience is versus where I think we're heading, you know, they probably do have data to say the traditional 50 year old man does watch this show at this time. So I think sometimes like what I see in a lot of my content could differ from the traditional television. But one thing I would ditch the suits. I yeah. don't know a single sports fan who wears a suit and goes to a sporting event or talks with their friends and gets in a heated debate while they're in a suit and tie. They wear jerseys, they wear t-shirts, they wear shorts. Great point. So I would, I would ditch the suits. I would get younger and I would start hiring the heck out of the young talent in the game right now. Uh, we, we grew up on SVP, obviously, but Stuart Scott and yep. all these amazing names. And it seems like they kind of have picked the general broadcaster over like the really, really talented ones. Um, but I would get ahead of it and start hiring up these young guys. They did great with Omar. I think Omar's got a great pulse on it. I don't know if he's particularly going to be on TV for them, but I would find, you know, the, the best YouTubers in the world that TNT mm -hmm. found um, and that really connect with the audience, have those pre-existing audiences because they can actually drive to the television. You see a familiar face. Reggie Miller, you know, he's a legend of the game, but yeah. should he, is he the most talented in the game? I don't know. It's just, that's how it used to work. He's a superstar player. He kind of shifts to that realm. So I would get younger, obviously continue to build on social as they're doing, but be conscious and, and actually listen to what the sports fan is. What the sports fan is, is the most important. You have a really targeted audience. You can really define who you are speaking to. I would imagine you have a lot of brands coming to you, a lot of people who want to partner with you, which is a great position to be in. I'm envious, right? I think that's fantastic. Um, how hard is that? I mean, you talked about authentic partnerships, and I love that. I, and, I, and I love the fact that you're talking about embedding with these brands, actually using them, actually having them a part of your authentic communication. But how much do you have to actually turn down? How much do you actually say, like, nope? not the right match for us. And are those hard conversations to have? I don't think we're turning down anyone. I mean, unless we kind of are booked up in that field, I think we're always open to it. Um, and we love to hear from obviously a ton of brand sponsors on how they want to work together. They have to think about our audience the way we do, which is giving back to them and, and really moving forward. And we've had brand partners who they come in and they try and control the content. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a, it's a double negative because we don't want to do that and it's not going to help them in the long haul. So I think that is more so like the most important first interaction is they understand our content. They want to let us create the content for the audience that we know will work and we need to integrate them in a natural way. So uh, it's not it's not a tough conversation. I think it's totally healthy to 
go and talk to partners and say, you know what, this just doesn't work for both sides. It's not going to perform well for you and it's not going to be fun for us to do. Um, and we can kind of lead them to someone we, we think would be better. But uh, you can see in the background like Puma. I wear Pumas all the time. I yep. love Puma. A bunch of the Knicks players wear Puma. So, yeah. you know, all these things, the little things just start to matter a lot when you really look into it. Yeah, for sure. And I love the authenticity. I know we use that word a lot, but like I can tell at this at, at this age and this is so long that I've been in the media, you can tell when an athletes talking about a brand they have no interest in. Yeah. You can tell. It's painful. And it's like, I'm not interested. But you can also tell when it's like really true to what they use, how they operate, what they like, they're passionate about it. Um, I just I just love those environments when it starts to get to feel real. And I'm I'm way more convinced by something like that. So Stay true to that authenticity yeah. with your brand partners. I had Michelle Andres on the show recently, who's SVP of Ravens Media, so your team, Baltimore Ravens. And we talked about that difficulty as a team when you have to be multi-platform, right? You have to be on Twitter, Facebook, touching all these audience, grabbing fans from wherever they are. And I said, well, how do you determine you know, where to allocate your time? How much time? How do you kind of carve that up? And she, I didn't bring up Snap, but she did. And she said, you know, Snap's one of those ones we have to look at and wonder, does it have a future? So when you hear something like that, what does that make you think? I mean, you, you've obviously invested a lot in here. Obviously, you believe in the platform. But do you have any fears in that regard? Do you have any fears of not even just like a, a, an indictment on Snap, but like, oh, my gosh, if I put all my effort into Facebook and Facebook went away or there was some sort of government regulation that changed everything, I'm in trouble. Like, do you ever have to worry about that? What would you say to that kind of feedback from somebody like Michelle? Owning the audience is, is super important. And so while I stress that go all in on one platform, once you kind of have hit there, definitely start to spread across and start to build on those other platforms. Ownership of audience as a whole is super complicated. What's the best way to own it? Is it an email? Is it a phone number? We're on community text now, which I think is super, super interesting going forward. Yeah. But can you truly ever own your audience without those platforms that are centralized, which is a really good way for crypto and NFTs to kind of find their way that their whole concept is decentralization. So if Twitter goes away, if Instagram or Snap were to go away, if Snap were to go away tomorrow, there's no doubt it would be a very big loss. It'd be a punch in the gut. Yeah. <laughs> it would be a very big loss. I think one of the benefits to it right now, and it's lasted for the past four years. I mean, people thought that Snap was going to die when Instagram added stories. And fortunately, yeah. it did not. So, yeah, that's that's an absolute game you are playing as you diversify, understanding that, you know, Vine went away and platforms mm -hmm. have gone away over time and they've even lost interest over time. So I think always making sure if you do kind of get to that point where you've grown a nice size audience, capture your audience in unique ways, email, phone number across other socials. Yeah, for sure. Uh one trend we, you kind of referenced it earlier is uh, that's never gotten old in sports is debate. Uh, I mean, people have been debating in bars since the dawn of time. I mean, I swear. Uh, I'm personally a little tired of the way debate is done now because I think it's completely lost authenticity. And I think it tends to be somebody saying, all right, I'll argue whatever side you want. I just want to argue. Yeah. And there's this societal parody like we talk about where everybody's kind of jumping into parties and everybody's just fighting all the time. Um, but you guys have done some debate stuff. You do some debate content. Where are we with this? Do you still find it an interesting way to carve up discussions or, or do you think debates had its day? That's a really good question. I mean, we started a show two weeks ago called Here to Argue. So I hope that uh, <laughs> <laughs> bad timing if it's over. <laughs> uh, yeah, if it's over, that's tough. But episode three is doing well. So I, I don't hoping. think it is. I think it's probably just me that's tired of it. Nobody else is. <laughs> no, I think what we're really tired of is clickbait material. Yeah. And it's like these these big headlines, you know, one guy misses one shot and you know, we're debating over his entire legacy. His purpose on earth now That's what has I hate. to be debated. That's exactly right? what I hate. It's turned so negative rather than like, who's the best at X? It's why this person sucks. You know, it's like, that, it, it drives me nuts. So we talk, I don't know, if, are you a soccer fan at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're watching the obviously England, Italy, Euro final. It goes to PKs. And then we had the podcast like an hour later, our, our Sunday record for our Monday post. And I got on and I said, like, the 
whole thing on Twitter right now is about Southgate's mistakes, his decisions, yeah. the guy who missed. I'm like, w since when did it become that like we can't acknowledge the Italy keeper just one player of the tournament and saved multiple penalty kicks? Like, yep. why did why do we immediately turn to it's someone's fault? And it really it that's probably the most disappointing thing about social media. I call Instagram comment section a cesspool. I call Twitter's oh my reply gosh, section a cesspool. Like yep. it really is it's it's ugly there. So you do have to understand that some people are literally just doing it for engagement and mm -hmm. to avoid those. And then you have to realize that, you know, there's a reason why there are only thirty NBA GMs, because the guy on Twitter isn't going to make that those decisions <laughs> for your team. But it is stressful at times. Like it really is I mean, you want to talk about the Ravens and Lamar Jackson this guy yeah. led the league in passing touchdowns in a unanimous MVP season. He's 30 and seven in his career. And, the, and still to this day, he's a running back. He's a running back. He's a running yeah. back. And so, you know, I, I think people, there are funny jokes to be made, but yeah. the majority of it is just the same repetition. And it's the debate shows of can Lamar get it done? Yep. No, this other guy can. It's like that guy hasn't started a game in the league. So it, the debate content, if you can do it in a true regard, like Abe and I will get on the podcast and something that could be a debate on first take in the morning, we agree on and we're debating, you know, yeah. who is better and how how is this whatever. But the, the negativity definitely has found its way into the fold of sports. And I don't think it's anyone's fault, per se. Right. And I'm not trying to say it's all sunshine and ponies and like everything's perfect. I mean, obviously, there's subjects that are meaty that need debate and that aren't always positive i'm fine with that but some of the contrived i remember it's probably five or six years ago now watching it might have been first take uh, or one of the debate shows and it was taj boyd was graduating from clemson he was a quarterback at clemson and he was beyond average he never did anything in the nfl and somebody was debating whether he would be a better pro than tom brady and they were like tom brady's done Taj Boyd is the future. And I'm like, what are we doing here? Like, really? Come on. And it's just like, it's so ridiculous, some of these these topics that people choose to debate on and then get all fired up about just for a kind of virality. And it's like, it seems so forced to me. But anyway, I've gone too far down this, this <laughs> own personal soapbox. Okay, so the creator economy, different now than ever before. For the longest time, you know, those of us in the industry – there, there wasn't an avenue for us to be individual creators. Like we would have to work for an organization that would create. And now, obviously, and not just now, like for the last 15 years, we're talking about everybody having an ability to create. And so the word was content is king. You know, go create, go do, go, go make your own thing and see what happens. I heard you say recently, collaboration is king. Explain, because I like it. Collaboration, oh, where do I even begin? It's just... You've seen it at every level of social media. The Vine stars got big collaborating. The YouTube stars collaborated. The TikTokers, they all live in these big content houses. Now, can you at 42 move across the country to LA into a TikTok house? Uh, if you're listening to this, probably not. Yeah. If, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 encourage, I encourage you to do that. So, you know, what are the actual ways to collaborate? I think. Collaborating with the teams can be super fun if you can get to that point. Collaborating with other, everyone thinks that if someone listens to that person's content, they're not listening to mine. And I don't think that's true at all. I know it's not true. And so I think even if you get into the niche of it, right, if you're a Ravens content creator, you're not going to collab with another Ravens podcast because they're going to take views from you and you're going to take views from them. But no, you're actually going to be exposed to the perfect target audience. Yeah. And there's plenty of content. That's the reason there's Fox, NBC, ABC, ESPN. That's why you have 900 channels. You have five social media apps. It's because all we do right now is consume content. So collaboration is key. And normally if you collaborate, once again, you do have to be authentic, right? You do have to take an interest in the other person. Your content does have to match. So there's ways to do it. But, you know, one of my favorite content creators is in the fantasy space, fantasy space, Pete Overzet. I do club top shot with him. He's collaborating with a chess instructor right now and he's learning how to play chess, but he's funny. So he's putting his comedic spin on it. And really on paper, it doesn't make sense. He's trying to gain fantasy followers, right? right. In the long run. 
but I'm sure there's plenty of people who are numbers driven that play chess that also like fantasy football. So it doesn't always have to be a direct tie either. But all I know is that's the best exposure, especially when you're trying to grow from scratch. And then you go look at the top levels. All the celebrities hang out with each other. They tag each other and everything. They're cross posting because those are their friends and you follow all their friends and that's kind of the best exposure to that type of world. So collaboration, absolutely key. There's a million ways to do it. So don't be discouraged if the top YouTuber in the world won't do a video with you, work your way up, uh, be strategic in how you kind of do it. Do you have a favorite collaboration that you've done? Oh, my favorite collab. My favorite collab I've done was House of Highlights invited me to the uh, knockout game. They're doing these series with influencers. I played a game of knockout for 100 grand. I don't take myself seriously, by the way, because that's the most ridiculous thing <laughs> of all time. I finished third, so I didn't win. But, uh, that's you know, bad. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that was bad was first place won all the money, <laughs> but, but <laughs> oh, it, was it wasn't good, tiered. Yeah. Okay. yeah but but yeah. nonetheless, you know, they kind of naturally put us into a collaboration of eight other influencers. And I just got to meet all those people where we could then go do stuff in the future. We went and played a game of basketball afterwards and I was in some of their YouTube videos and my audience is seeing that. Cause like I said, they're watching other people besides you. And so that was awesome. And then obviously the collaboration of snapback and house of highlights that's another major thing is that the big media brands they don't let you collaborate so their talent actually doesn't have an opportunity to grow because if you work for fox and we're paying you a lot of money you cannot go on espn you're right you're on right? Our, our you are yeah, channel. on fox and with yeah. me i'm like i've worked with whistle i've worked with sports center and espn i've worked with house of highlights i love being exposed to new to new audiences that's the dream right yeah. that is the dream that's where you're going to get new followers and new fans from. So that as a whole was perfect. It's such a healthy perspective, too. I mean, I know for my, myself, I mean, I've always been wired in a very competitive way. And I used to battle against mentally, battle against collaboration in some ways. It's like, why would I want to boost somebody? Up? You know, like, blah, blah, blah. They're my yeah. comp competition. And it's like I've, I've had to shift this in the last five years and say, like, no, plenty of room in the pool. You know, like, let's have some fun and create some good stuff. And so I love to hear you say that, that you're starting out with that kind of an attitude because you're right. Some of the best stuff that you see out there is when, you know, some band does a cover and you're like, well, that's a totally different riff off on what they did. And that's like a, a, a very organic collaboration in a way or like these these inter, you know, get, getting together, like you said, you and, and House of Highlights. It's like you could look at them as competitors. You can say, like, I don't want anything to do with that. But you probably created some really cool stuff and introduced yourself to a new audience, which I think is just so healthy. Absolutely. I wish I had that and, attitude. I really do. I wish I had that attitude at your age. And, and since we're talking about sports, um, I wrote down in my notes the other day, I think one of the things I've learned in my life is learn how to build super teams. So Kevin Durant joins Golden State Warriors and everyone's like his legacy is a snake. He's a loser. In sports, like there's this thing that you got to kind of do it on your own. You got to be loyal. You got right all that, which I I understand it. It's like passion. I think what Giannis did by staying in Milwaukee is very honorable. And so however you want to feel, I know we're not going to get into a debate, but however you no, want to feel. We can. It's fine. You're, you're safe. It's however safe you want to feel about that, it <laughs> is what it is. Outside of playing on a court or a field, build the shit out of super teams. You yeah. don't have to limit yourself you don't have to be the superstar by yourself all the most successful people in the world they're all invested in each other's company they all work with each other they all share yeah. ideas build super teams and that's kind of the biggest advantage you could possibly have i love it it's a great attitude listen we'll finish up with this you've had given me so much of your time and i really appreciate it and i I'm enthused by this conversation. I just think it's fun to have because I love the trend of where we're going. I think it's so interesting. And I think if you're not adapting and changing and keeping an eye on what's happening, everything just passes you by, right? I mean, I've been in the industry, like we said, for a long time, but I'm very intrigued by all these new ways of delivering content, all these new ways of connecting with an audience. And I love the interchange and the, the engagement that comes from it. But I'd love to have, I mean, you seem like a futurist in some ways, you know, like somebody that's always kind of looking a couple steps ahead. Sports content, fandom, everything is changing. Like we talked about five years ago, social media was totally different than it is now. Everything's con that's the one standard change, right? So you have your finger on the pulse. Where does it all go from here? 
Any ideas? Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a broad question. No, but. no, no. I, I definitely have an answer for it. It's personality driven. So if you are a media company, go hire the best personalities, the ones who have shown an ability to grow an audience, the ones who you think are super talented. And by the way, if you think they are, they are very talented. Talent, you know, when it meets hard work, it rises to the top. And you then know it's, when you see it, yeah. it, it's player centric. So you can see the guy behind me, Stephen Curry, my audience, way more Steph Curry fans than there are Golden State Warrior fans. It's why sports okay. card collecting is huge. It's why NBA Top Shot got huge. It's why you follow individuals on social media who have more followers than the teams themselves do, mm -hmm. right? So I think player and personality centric stuff is what's going to drive the future. Love it. Jack, awesome conversation. Thank you for lending so much interest and credibility to all of this. And I, I think you've shown again that you've put in the work, you've thought, you've been very intentional about all of your steps here. Uh, and it's and it's impressive to see the growth that you've had. So congratulations to all your success and thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it very, very much. I had a blast. This is great. I love talking about this stuff. It's so important because you never know who's that one person out there that could really just take two seconds of this podcast and you might have just changed their life forever. So appreciate you, Brian. Thank you.